Thank you very much, Graham, for, uh, for, for joining me. And um, I know you through the Club of Rome. You're the Secretary General currently. Now, you've been with the Club of Rome for how long? Uh, I've been associated with the club for about seven years, and I've been Secretary General for nearly four. Uh-huh. So actually, I mean, this is, this is our 50th anniversary this year. We're, we were founded in um, 1968 by uh, an Italian industrialist and a Scottish scientist who was with the OECD. And they, uh, they founded the club uh, with a small group of people because they were concerned about the, the long-term future of humanity. I and mean, if you think back to the early 60s or late 60s, uh, I mean, we were talking about putting a man on the moon. Uh, it's, it, it was the, the hippie, hippie time, uh, peace and love, and everything seemed to be going in the right direction. Yet here was this group of, group of people who said, look, if we carry on developing and increasing our ecological footprint as we are today, then we're going to have a problem uh, sometime during the, the, the next century. And, and that's what led to limits of growth. And, and of course, limits of growth has proved, uh, although a shock as it was in 1972, it's proved basically correct. I mean, everything that, that was anticipated in that book has, is coming, coming to pass. Yes, and um, I will note that it was um, ridiculed and, and lambasted and criticized by mainstream economists who um, did not like that it undercut their main assumption that you can grow forever. Yeah, I mean, I think but there's a big mistake, misunderstanding there because we're not, and the club is not against economic growth. And even today, we, we're kind of agnostic about economic growth. But what, we're, what the book's about is what we would call today the human ecological footprint, because we live today as if we have one and a half planets, actually more than that, and that's simply not sustainable for the long term. And so if we're to live sustainably, then we need to reduce the gap between rich and poor, uh, and we need to find some way of, of letting the, the poor seven billion people on the planet have some sort of decent standard of living. But we have to reduce the overall ecological footprint so that we're we're not going to drive ourselves towards particularly a climate crisis. It's the climate that's the biggest problem right now. What, what is the name and what was the premise of uh, the, that first book you wrote? So the first book was called The End of Progress, How Modern Economics Has Failed Us. Uh, and and it, it simply looked at, at not just resources uh, and population, but it looked at what's happening in terms of inequality and unemployment uh, and about how social development in the rich world and the poor world has uh, stalled in many ways since the since the early 1980s that we had all this great progress after the Second World War, but actually since then things have not been going so well and and we've been lured into this false false belief that the economic system we have today is a good thing and and we need to question that. Uh, how have we been lured into that false belief? Okay, so I mean we think for example that economic growth is a good thing. But of course, economic growth requires us to use more resources, which requires us to use more energy, which then creates more CO2, which creates climate change. So the push for economic growth is the direct cause of climate change. Economic growth requires us to use more resources, which requires us to use more energy, which then creates more CO2, which creates climate change. So the push for economic growth is the direct cause of climate change. We also think that economic growth creates jobs, and that's true in the short term, but in the long term, growth comes from improving productivity. And to do that means that you have to mechanize and robotize uh, and, and computerize. And that in the long term actually increases unemployment. Yeah. And when we also have this belief that, that free trade is good, but actually it's not doing a huge amount for much of the poor world. And then finally, we think that that the economic system today has some trickle-down effect, that it 
moves wealth from the rich to the poor, that the, the overall living standards will improve. Whereas, in fact, that's actually not the case at all. What the system does is it moves wealth from the poor to the rich and from the poor world to the rich world. But that's part of the market system, to sell itself, to portray itself as, as a panacea. My thesis is that the system as constituted sells itself. It promotes itself. It's, it's a meme. And um, it, in order for that meme to persist, that idea to be self-perpetuating, it has to um, cast itself in the best light. And so, yeah, exactly. What's, it's become, as, as an Italian philosopher, Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci says, it's become a common sense. We've, we, we've come to think of the system as common sense. Mm. And so we've stopped questioning it. And, and, so, and so most people live through their days thinking that growth is good, thinking that the economic system is functioning. And we need to all step back a bit to see that actually it's, it's killing us if we carry on like this. Another element was that the, after the Second World War, and until the 1980s, the late 1980s, there was a competing system. I mean, there was the Cold War, there was this communist system. And, and, and so we had a sort of benevolent uh, free market system because it had to be a little bit kinder. And then since the collapse of the communist system, there's been no competition. And so it's become, I think, a little bit less caring uh, and a little bit more for about making money and a little bit less about creating good society. That's that's an interesting analysis. I had not thought about that. That the uh, right the fall of of communism allowed the worst of the current market system to take over. Mm -hmm. I like to think that the the bankers, uh, the central bankers, the banking establishment um, needs to to recognize the that money ultimately is a fiction. Is a creation of, of human intellect. Um, and that old uh, Cree saying, and not until the last river is poisoned, the last fish is caught, and the last tree is felled, will humanity realize that you can't eat money. Yeah. We printed, we printed trillions of dollars in the US, in Europe, and Japan to try and save the banking system after the financial crisis. And uh, and actually, it didn't seem to matter very much at all. It hasn't created massive inflation. But even if it does, we can print money to solve this problem because printing money will not kill us. But this problem will kill us unless we do something about it. Yeah, but my point is you print that money and people are going to spend it and spending oh. it is going to take more oil and more uh, cement and more steel and more of everything. I'm not suggesting that. But what I'm suggesting is if we need to build a different infrastructure for energy, Let's print the money and build the infrastructure and let's print the money and give it to the people in the coal, oil and gas industry so they don't starve Got to it. make the position. Let's not make money a barrier to change. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll agree there. <laughs> <laughs>